I've been with the Kalamazoo River Watershed Council for a number of years. We work to do things like prevent stormwater, clean up old legacy contaminants in the Kalamazoo River. And what was amazing is we have one of the most, one of the largest PCB contamination issues in anywhere in the country, actually. And we've been working and making some progress there. And in July of 2010, Enrich's pipeline failed. The pipeline right down below me in this picture, which you can see, the 30-inch pipeline split under the ground in the muck of a wetland. Beth mentioned the wetland. To give you a visual, five acres of wetland filled up with tar sands oil to several feet of depth. That oil had pushed through the muck to come to the surface. It's hard to tell exactly how far out away from the break it went, but that five-acre wetland was one of the first places to be sucked dry and dug up multiple times to try to get at that oil. It moved from there down Talmadge Creek, about one and a half to two miles to the Kalamazoo River. Talmadge Creek, normally you can jump across, it's small. When it was flowing with tar sands oil, it was flowing black, pure oil. It pushed all the water down, pushed all the fish out, and any other aquatic creature that was there. Talmadge Creek has been dug up at least two times in an attempt to get at all the oil that flowed through that system. Talmadge Creek at the time, was way outside of its normal banks in its floodplain because the weather the previous days had given us a near historic flow in the Kalamazoo River and Talmadge Creek. So we had tar sands oil floating, moving downstream, spreading out into the floodplain, and it went to the Kalamazoo River, which flows fast towards Kalamazoo, covered 35 to 40 miles. What everyone learned about tar sands oil was that it floats first. Then the benzene burns off into the air it's the smell that someone mentioned in the back. It's a smell that I smelled. I happened to be passing over the Kalamazoo River. I got a phone call that day. A reporter said, what do you think about the oil spill? And I was immediately thinking the Gulf of Mexico at that time. That was all I could think of. And he said, no, the Kalamazoo River. And I started to smell the benzene. And I could smell it from a couple miles out, drove over a bridge over Talmadge Creek, switched highways, drove over another bridge over the Kalamazoo River. And I could smell that benzene. And that became a big part of the story a heavy impact on the local people that lived around that spill site and downwind. And the benzene, as that burned off, the tar sands oil got heavy and it began to sink. And that sinking problem is something we're still working on in the Kalamazoo River watershed. So originally 843,000 gallons of tar sands oil flowed down our rivers. The Kalamazoo River was flowing black from bank to bank for a dozen miles or so before it began to sort of spread out and burn off. A lot of oil sank. The estimate now is that we still have 180,000 gallons of this thicker sort of peanut butter mayonnaise, if you will, tar sands oil on the bottom of the river. And agencies are out there forcing Enbridge to do cleanup, not to everyone's satisfaction for sure. And that cleanup continues. They're still learning about how hard it is to clean up the oil which is highly relevant to our situation here. Imagine any kind of break and leak and flow resulting in the same problem with oil stuck to or sitting on the bottom, getting mixed in with the sediments. So it's a serious issue. Our agencies aren't good at or experienced with cleaning it up, but they're working on it. So this hit me in the gut. Uh, it's moved to my heart. And I think it's now stuck in my head. What I did after this happened was I had been following the 350.org movement sort of from the sideline for a long time. There was an action in Washington, D.C. I went, I sat in front of the White House to make a statement about tar sands oil. Was anyone else there to sit in front of the White House? Thank you for doing that. That was my foray into direct action. I want to acknowledge that direct action has been around a long time, and there are people here who have gone much further. They put themselves on the line. They've spent time in jail. So thank you, those of you who have gone that distance and continue that fight. I haven't gone that far yet. The nerdy scientist in me is still kind of lingering in the back, uh, but this problem is pushing me forward nonetheless. So I learned a lot about and appreciate now what it means to organize people and to start at the grassroots and to make our leaders listen to us. And when our leaders say, make me do it, we need to be there ready and organized to make that happen. And I think that's happening here. I'm very excited about it. So I think all of you who chose to be here today are already heroes in your own way. I think that's really important. And when you go home and you think, my heroes in the climate movement are Bill McKibben or others, I think you have to make that linkage to your local place 
And maybe you're already fighting. Maybe you're already thinking, I've done 350.org actions. I am part of the transition movement. I am thinking resilience beyond sustainability. I am looking at durable living. All of these things that you're thinking, maybe you have a garden, maybe you sold your car, maybe there's something happening. Keep it going and let yourselves lead in your local communities. Step forward. We need leaders, we need voices, and we need confidence. And I think, though you might be nervous, in time you can build up to it and you can do it. So be a hero. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to tell you more about the river. I'll be here for a while on this side. Thank you.